Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the final day of the conference. Uh, before I announce the um, Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecture, uh, I'd like to um, recognize Nelson and Mary Nash, who are uh, Hayek Society members and who have just celebrated birthdays. So the luncheon that follows this lecture will be in their honor, and there will be birthday cake in the line. So I would like to thank Nelson and Mary. They, they've done a really a, a great deal for the Mises Institute and for the cause of human liberty and free markets. Jeffrey Herbener is our Ludwig von Mises Memorial Lecturer. Uh, the, the title of his talk will be Time and the Theory of Cost, and it's sponsored by James Walker. Uh, Dr. Herbener is Chairman of the Department of Economics and Professor of Economics at Grove City College. He earned his bachelor's degree in economics from Nebraska Wesleyan University and his master's degree and PhD in economics from Oklahoma State University. Professor Herbener is the editor of two books, The Meaning of Ludwig von Mises and The Pure Time Preference Theory of Interest, to which he has made a notable uh, contribution in, in his introductory essay. Uh, that book has been translated into Chinese. Uh, he has published over 100 articles in popular and scholarly venues, including the Wall Street Journal, Investors, Business Daily, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, and the Journal of Libertarian Studies. Professor Herbener is a senior scholar at the Ludwig von Mises Institute and a fellow at the Center for Vision and Values at Grove City College. He also teaches courses in Tom Wood's Liberty Classroom. Please help me welcome Jeffrey Herbener. Thank you, Joe. It's, uh, it's a great uh, privilege to be able to uh, <clears throat> deliver the lecture. I want to say I'm kind of ambivalent about, uh, about Trump uh, because, of course, uh, my book sales in China will go way down if Trump is, uh, is elected. But uh, <laughs> I guess there may be more, more important reasons to uh, think about uh, Trump. Uh, <laughs> anyway, I'd like to uh, also... Uh, uh, thank uh, the sponsor uh, for this lecture, James Walker, uh, for his generosity in making uh, making this lecture uh, uh, feasible, and uh, for the support. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, and for all the uh, supporters, the Nashes here uh, who have come uh, uh, today as well. <clears throat> and I'd also like to take this, take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Lou Rockwell. Uh, for his uh, entrepreneurial genius and uh, tireless efforts in uh, making uh, the Mises Institute the world's leading center for the study of Austrian economics. Thank you, Lou. <laughs> you should probably quit while I'm ahead, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but James Walker paid for this, so we're gonna we're gonna forge on. And uh, the <laughs> the uh, title of my um, uh, talk is uh, somewhat of a uh, allusion to my main field of research, which has been in time and time preference and and so on. Uh, and I'd like to then in this talk uh, sort of extend uh, this discussion. Uh, beyond uh, just the time preference element of time and into other uh, aspects of time and what effect they have uh, on the theory of cost. Uh, I take as my uh, starting point Mises' admonition that we read here in uh, Human Action where he says, economists often erred in neglecting the element of time. Take, for instance, the controversy concerning the effects of changes in the quantity of money. Some people are only concerned with long-run effects that is, with the final prices and final state of rest. Others saw only the short-run effects, the prices of the instant following the change in the data. Both were mistaken, and their conclusions were consequently vitiated. Many more examples of the same blunder could be cited. And so uh, my uh, uh, contention is that the theory of cost is also a, uh, an example of uh, this blunder where the element of time has not been fully integrated into the theory of cost. So that's basically my uh, task here in the paper. 
<clears throat> now, uh, Rothbard, I might point out, is uh, also uh, uh, holds this position. This is in uh, uh, a uh, commentary that he did on uh, Israel Kirzner's book, uh, Market Theory and the Price System. And uh, Rothbard on page seven said, the a uh, abstention from money is unfortunate but not fatal, but the abstention from time and capital analysis is. Problems of time, capital, and interest must be infused into the price analysis. <laughs> now, as I thought through uh, what that implied, when we infuse time into the cost analysis, what what uh, implications it has, I, I actually uh, would like to um, uh, offer two um, in innovations or uh, advancements. <clears throat> One is that uh, it, it has to do with this uh, this substantive point that when we think about time in the theory of costs, we have to take into account, and we have not done this even in the Austrian uh, school, at least not analytically, we have to take into account um, change and uncertainty that is bound up with real time. And then the second uh, contention that I'd like to um, uh, argue for in my remarks is a little bit more controversial. Uh, I would like to uh, contend that it's possible if in doing this to uh, retain the analytical structure of cost curves. <clears throat> Now, I know that that uh, contention is uh, controversial and uh, goes against Rothbard's own uh, views, where here in Man, Economy, and State, he, he expresses his, uh, his lack of appreciation for cost curves, where he says, uh, as an explanation of the pricing of factors and the allocation of output, it is obvious that cost curves add nothing new to the discussion in terms of marginal productivity. At best, the two are reversible. But in addition, the shift brings with it many grave deficiencies and errors. Now, I, now I find this a little bit um, strange that Rothbard would take this position uh, for the following reason. And again, this, this is really my motive in um, uh, putting this information together. Um, Rothbard very famously in Man, Economy, and State uh, provided the analytical apparatus that uh, you don't find in human action. So in Mises, we have all these great insights, but the presentation is completely verbal. You don't see any demand and supply graphs or you know, production curves or anything of the sort. Even though verbally, Mises is uh, giving us all that we need to understand these uh, principles. <clears throat> what Rothbard does in Man, Economy, and State is uh, build in this apparatus. There's a supply and demand curves and their uh, production relationships and so on and so forth. And, and it, so he's adding all of this um, standard uh, economic uh, apparatus to uh, Mises, Mises's insights. He's building uh, the apparatus for them. And then when it gets to cost analysis, uh, we just fall back into the narrative. There, there's, there's no real analytics in, in the treatment of cost. Uh, I'll have to uh, suggest a caveat to that remark, but uh, it, generally speaking, this is, this is so. And, and so, again, one might think of my remarks as uh, simply extending the Rothbard uh, project of providing a good, solid analytics to the uh, insights of Mises. Now, in order to do this, let's, uh, let's just start with a brief uh, account uh, of what the cost structure looks like that uh, Rothbard is arguing against. Why did he reject uh, the cost structure of the neoclassical school? And all of you uh, that studied neoclassical economics will recognize the short run, and then we'll put up the long run cost curves. <clears throat> and the sense in which Rothbard, in the previous quote, uh, claimed that uh, the cost curves are reversible. And so what he what he is referring to is that the U shape of the cost curves is just the mirror image of the of the uh, uh, hump shape, the parabola shape of uh, the production relationship. So we have marginal physical product. Uh, where we have a, a fixed capital capacity, we add more and more labor to the fixed capital, and we have increasing and, and diminishing returns to the additional labor. <clears throat> and then uh, if an entrepreneur is buying that labor, buying the, that additional labor in the market, and calculating his costs per unit of output, his marginal costs, the additional costs per unit of output, uh, then the, the cost case uh, curves, excuse me, will be U-shaped. 
So Rothbard's point in Man, Economy, State, quite correct, I, I don't dispute uh, what he claims, is that we don't need cost curves in order to do the basic uh, analysis of factor prices and then production decisions. That, that I agree with this. So we, we just have marginal physical product, and then as he shows, the entrepreneur will assess the marginal revenue product, the revenue that can be generated by hiring the factor of production, and then make uh, uh, his, his uh, demands for the factor of production accordingly. And then with those demands, we get prices for factors of production, and those prices are sufficient for us to do cost analysis. So, so this is how he proceeds. <clears throat> uh, but we might ask the question, what exactly is the objection, the, the, the fundamental objection to uh, employing the cost curve? And here, uh, I'll have a quote in a minute to verify this, but Rothbard says, uh, the problem is, of course, there, there's the assumption of fixed factor prices. <clears throat> so as the entrepreneurs are buying more and more labor, the assumption is that the price of labor is staying the same no matter the demand for labor. Now that seems you know, uh, a false on the face of it, or at least not a general principle. Uh, the neoclassical economists, of course, um, justify this assumption by a further assumption that all of the entrepreneurs in this market are atomistic, right? They're small, and so when they increase their demand, it doesn't affect the market demand. <clears throat> uh, that, of course, as we'll see in a minute, uh, Rothbard objects to this, even if that's true, as Rothbard uh, points out, it, this uh, overlooks the fixed price of the capital that's being used, the fixed cost, right, of the capital that's being used. And so we have to take into account uh, capitalization in, in doing a proper cost analysis. <clears throat> but I don't think uh, it's necessary to throw out the entire apparatus. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this is uh, what Rothbard says uh, about the uh, capital, right? Uh, further, the results of abstention from capital leads to all the crucial errors of cost curve analysis. It's because, because again, you get this uh, just one-to-one -one correspondence between production, marginal product, and marginal cost, when in fact what's happening is the, the whole cost structure is changing as the entrepreneur's demand is changing for the factors of production. Uh, okay, so he says, uh, for example, so one of the errors he points out, he says, for example, uh, that a firm will invest funds in production up to the point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. But once again, I think the problem here is in the assumptions of the neoclassical model and not in the apparatus itself. I think uh, we, we, can, we can modify the apparatus, we can adapt it to uh, better, more realistic uh, assumptions and preserve it. Um, anyway, I, what I would say about this, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, remember again, this as we showed on the last uh, panel, is the idea that if an entrepreneur is in this short run period with fixed capital and fixed factor prices, and then a revenue structure, a demand for his product, then he'll produce unit by unit as long as marginal revenue exceeds marginal cost, right out to the point where marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost. Now, it seems to me the problem with this uh, harkens all the way back to the uh, marginalist revolution. And the distinction between the way that Menger thought of the marginal in uh, his analysis and the way the neoclassical economists eventually thought of the marginal in their analysis. So as, if we adopt the Mengerian view, though, I think we avoid this uh, problem of looking at technical units one by one altogether. Uh, what we need to do is simply recognize that uh, the marginal unit, as Menger uh, advised, is the unit that the actor selects as suitable to his or her action. So it isn't the technical unit that we're interested in when we uh, buy and sell and act uh, in the market. It's the amount of the good that we're choosing as suitable. So uh, spring has come early in Pennsylvania and the grass is already growing, very unusual for uh, uh, this early in the year. And so I've already gone down to the gas station and uh, filled up my one gallon, one gallon can of gasoline that I use for my lawnmower. So when I was down at the gas station filling up my gas can, my uh, unit, the unit I was interested in buying was, you know, just under a gallon. Uh, when I fill up my car, it's 12 gallons or some other amount, right? I'm not, I'm not interested in the technical unit of a gallon. 
I'm interested in the amount of the good that's suitable for my purposes. Now, entrepreneurs are no different. Entrepreneurs engage in production runs where, where they're interested in producing a certain, they have a time horizon in mind. And they're interested in producing a certain amount of a good over some period and then selling that good. They have a period of production or a per period of provision that they're interested in. <clears throat> so uh, just a simple illustration of this is uh, some of you may know that uh, Apple Inc. has come out uh, with a new uh, iteration of the iPhone, the iPhone SE, which is a small four-inch screen iPhone with, packed with all the cutting-edge uh, tech inside. And uh, the uh, Tim Cook and his entrepreneurial group, of course, have uh, already produced a large number, of, you know, large number of units of these iPhones, and uh, you know, maybe say ten million of them. And it's that that they're thinking about when they think about cost. In other words, they, six months ago, they were thinking, if we want to produce 10 million iPhones over the first year, wh what exactly is the asset configuration under which we'll do this? And, and, and that's how they make decisions, right? They don't say, hey, we have fixed assets. And then each unit, we just think about how, how things proceed. So, so I think this, this basic idea of economizing, of just saying, you know, we're comparing the marginal revenue to the marginal cost of the actual units that people are acting with can be preserved uh, while we jettison the, this artificial uh, technical unit part of the analysis um, in, in the neoclassical uh, approach. Now, in doing this, uh, it should be apparent to you that marginal cost then doesn't refer to just the cost of the variable input, right? It, it refers to the cost of all of the inputs that are chosen in this production run. And so, so that's the modification. That's what uh, Rothbard is referring to as capital, or capitalization. Right? How, do, how are the assets being valued? And how do they enter into the cost uh, that's relevant for decision? Uh, so here's how Rothbard puts it. He says, uh, there's no one simple determinant marginal cost because as we have seen above, there's no one identifiable short run period such as assumed by current theory. The firm faces a gamut of variable periods of time for the investment and use of factors and its pricing and output decisions depend on the future period of time which it is considering. <clears throat> Uh, it might look something like this if we were to do an, uh, uh, the simple analytics of it would look something like this <clears throat> Where in this uh, diagram we've got uh, different different uh, Units of production and sale of a good a smaller production and sale and then a medium production and sale and a larger production and sale and Then the total revenue and total costs that are associated with those different decisions so uh, to to extend my uh, uh, my example of uh, the iPhone uh, SE, it might be that uh, if uh, Tim Cook and his entrepreneurial group, if they thought that the production run was going to be uh, 4 million uh, iPhones, that they would uh, choose a production apparatus for this, let's say um, contracting out the production to uh, some you know, American producer uh, for this, uh, that would be associated with the revenue stream that would keep the cost structure in line with the revenue stream. They can do this in advance as a matter of choosing, right? Then if they, if to the contrary, if they thought that the production run was going to be 10 million, they would incur in a, in a different uh, uh, arrangement of assets. They might, they might uh, transfer the production to a single factory that they have in China, let's say, and produce all the iPhone SEs in that single factory. Uh, for various reasons, the cost structure would be different, but it would be in alignment again with the revenue that they anticipate from, uh, from the sale of that volume of, of the iPhone and so on, right? So, so th this would be the simple analytics of thinking about how we would uh, do cost analysis. Again, we don't have cost curves here, right? This is just the, uh, the Austrians have already done this kind of analysis, right? We're already thinking in these terms uh, with respect to the cost structure. Again, I, I want to suggest that there are two improvements uh, in this kind of basic analysis that, that we can engage in. Uh, and uh, just to reiterate, and we'll go through the demonstration in a minute, one has to do with the uh, forward-looking nature of costs, and therefore the element of time, and the other has to do with the, the actual analytics of cost curves. <clears throat> now, um, 
uh, uh, Joe Salerno said something in his talk uh, yesterday that uh, I think is helpful in uh, framing this. Um, Joe Salerno used the phrase, I believe the phrase was uh, first order abstractions and second order abstractions. So he was talking about first order abstractions being things like the value scale that, that we have. That, that's an analytical apparatus, a uh, concept of uh, analysis that we use uh, that relates to people's choices that we use to analyze people's choices. Then the demand curve is a second order abstraction. It's further abstract from the actual action of people, right? But, but yet it's useful. It's, it's useful to have demand and supply and to use demand and supply analysis, even though they're second order abstractions. So again, I would suggest that cost curves are second order abstractions. Do we absolutely need them to do the analysis? No, we can stick with first order abstractions and and uh, everything is actually in the analysis that we need uh, to, to understand the world. But second order abstractions have some usefulness. They, they, they have some uh, value added to uh, our understanding. And, uh, and once again, Austrians are not shy about using these second order abstractions. We all use demand and supply apparatus and, and so on. So again, I don't think we should be, uh, I think as uh, Carl Friedrich Israel uh, admonish us about econometrics, we shouldn't be afraid, right, <laughs> to think, uh, think these things through. <clears throat> uh, okay, so one more, uh, one more uh, quote from Rothbard on this particular point. He says, some factors are best used in a certain quantity over a certain range of output, while others yield best results over other ranges of output. The result is not a dichotomy between fixed and variable costs, as in the neoclassical view, but a condition of many degrees of variability for the various factors. And uh, once again, just to uh, see what Rothbard's speaking about, let's be reminded of how the neoclassical economists do a long-run uh, cost analysis. So here we have the long-run uh, envelope curve, where the each short-run production technique uh, falls within this long run curve. And again, the, the problem, the basic problem with this that Rothbard has identified already is that um, there's the assumption of fixed factor prices, not, not only for each short run production technique, but now also for the capital assets that are involved in each long run technique, right? They're, they're, uh, they're just a given uh, price for the, for the uh, factories and equipment in in the production technique one and then production technique two and so on and so forth. Uh, and this is again, I think uh, what, uh, what Rothbard is fundamentally objecting to. M maybe not the second order abstraction itself, but these underlying uh, unrealistic assumptions. <clears throat> now we might ask again the question, how do the neoclassical economists uh, justify this? Uh, we saw before with the short run, they justify the fixity of uh, variable input prices in the short run by saying that we, we have to assume that we have uh, atomistic producers, all little teeny tiny producers, so that when they change their demand, it won't their individual demand, it won't affect the market. And so factor prices are fixed as the demand changes and they move from one production level to another. Uh, here, the, it's slightly different because here we can have a whole industry, of course, moving at once. And so that particular assumption wouldn't seem to help us in thinking about why factor prices for assets should be fixed. And here I think the basic assumption that uh, allows this or justifies this is that in the neoclassical analysis, each of these selection alternatives is assumed to be instantly or fully adjusted to every other aspect of the economy, right? So we have a general equilibrium, in other words, that's pertaining for each choice that the entrepreneur makes in this particular market. And so there, they're saying that the endpoint asset price then, after the adjustment takes place, the endpoint asset price would be set or fixed. <clears throat> uh, so again, I think we can um, reject that assumption. It's certainly fanciful and incorrect, uh, and yet perhaps retain uh, the analysis, the apparatus uh, of cost curves. <clears throat> Now, as, uh, as uh, the first quote that I gave you from Mises points out, and uh, the next one from Rothbard, if we think about the Austrian analysis with respect to time, 
then what are the time frames? If the time frames for to reject the neoclassical time frames is short run, long run, because we think again that that's completely, completely wrong and not, not just arbitrary, but it, it lends, it generates the wrong uh, result in analysis because it doesn't allow for capital values to change. Um, then what are the right time periods? Well, the right time periods, as uh, Mises alluded to, uh, and as Rothbard here explicitly says, are the immediate run and then the long run. So Rothbard says, furthermore, there aren't, remember here he's saying not just in price theory, he says, furthermore, there are in production theory two important, interesting concepts involving periods of time. One is what we may call the immediate run, the market prices of commodities and factors based uh, uh, on the basis of given stocks and speculative demands. You see, he already, he already has this verbally, he already has the notion that I'm pressing for, that we have to integrate into our analysis the anticipations of the entrepreneur, the, the expectations of the entrepreneur, uh, and given consumer valuations. The other important concept is that of the final price or the long run equilibrium price, uh, the price established in the ERE. <clears throat> Uh, the question again is, uh, if we think about this just in the Austrian framework, the, the question then that was posed uh, initially by Mises in, in my uh, first quote is, how exactly then in a framework constrained like this, do we engage in dynamic, so to speak, dynamic analysis over time? Uh, capitalization is going to happen over time as demands change and entrepreneurs adapt to this change. So, so don't we need some kind of intermediate time frame to think about like the neoclassicals have, you know, some short run time frame or long run time frame? H how can we operate within this uh, constraint, so to speak? And again, I'm, uh, uh, what my suggestion is that we can in fact operate in this constraint and that uh, thinking more carefully about the element of time and, and expectations is the way to see that this framework uh, can remain intact and, and be uh, in fact useful in doing analysis like this. Now, once again, let me uh, just uh, rehearse a little bit of this. Um, uh, in anticipation of uh, how we might amend this analysis. So this is the immediate run uh, price of a good. Uh, I, I got this uh, diagram directly from uh, Man, Economy, and State. This is in uh, Chapter 10. And <clears throat> uh, those of you who are uh, you know, very familiar with uh, Rothbard's work know that Chapter 10 is dealing with competition and monopoly. And uh, Rothbard uh, is uh, grappling with the standard arguments about monopoly. And so he's using a kind of standard apparatus, right? He goes ahead and uses a, a, a more neoclassical apparatus, including cost curves. But he begins, uh, well, at one point, I should say, he, he introduces this immediate run analysis that he uh, borrows from uh, Wixell, where we have the total stock of a good at any point in time, this given total stock of a good, and then we have the total demand uh, for the good by all the participants in the market. This again is something that Joe Salerno was mentioning in his talk, that uh, it's better to, uh, the more general way of thinking about all analysis of pricing and so on is in terms of stocks. These are the fundamental things, right? We have goods, we have actual existing goods to, to act with. And, uh, and uh, that is sufficient, uh, thinking about that is sufficient for us to explain where the prices of these things come from. And flows are always implications, right? Effects. Uh, from the way we act with respect to the stocks of things. <clears throat> now, uh, let me mention one more thing about this. The, the total demand, the DD curve, the total demand, Rothbard uh, in another place uh, points out can be uh, broken into two parts. There's the exchange demand by the buyers. So there, let's say again, this is the, uh, the market for uh, iPhone SE. So there, there's demand uh, for, you know, from you and I, people like you and I, customers who want to buy the iPhone. This is called exchange demand by Rothbard. And then there's reservation demand by Apple. So Apple owns the iPhones. They're going to supply them. And their, their action of supplying could also be thought of as reservation demand. So at certain prices, they'd be willing to supply more by holding less by releasing the supply, and then at lower prices, they'd be willing to sell less and retain uh, more of the supply. 
<clears throat> so we can break, uh, we can then do the standard analysis, right? Breaking out the um, exchange demand from the reservation demand. This is what the standard analysis would look like. We have demand from the consumer's subjective values for the iPhone, and then we have supply by the entrepreneur's opportunity costs. And this is just the reservation demand turned around, right? <clears throat> and then the further point of analysis, again, where we get to the expectations part of this, um, we can break the, the categories of entrepreneur's opportunity costs into two. Uh, one is personal use. And for most entrepreneurs, the personal use of the good that they produced is pretty low, right? Uh, so. Presumably, uh, Tim Cook is already using the prototype of uh, iPhone 7 and <laughs> won't personally use any of these iPhone 6s. And then he can either, you know, Apple can either sell to a customer right now in this market or they can hold the good again and sell it into the future, right, uh, uh, to customers in the future. So there's demand in the future would be an opportunity cost that they give up if they sell the good uh, today. So, so again, this is the standard uh, analysis of immediate run um, prices of goods. Okay, then same thing for factors of production, right? We have immediate run prices of the factors of production. <clears throat> and uh, it's exactly the same analysis, except here we're looking at, say, tech workers who are hired by Apple and other uh, tech companies. And we have the supply uh, by the workers. And how is that determined? Well, they supply based on their opportunity costs, based on the offer and the opportunity costs. And the opportunity cost could be one of two things. They could have personal use for their human effort, or they could um, anticipate uh, greater demand in the future by a different entrepreneur. And they could reject one offer and hold out and then supply their uh, tech services to uh, someone else in the future. And then we have demand on the part of uh, Apple and other tech companies that want to hire the workers. And here we have the entrepreneur's judgment of that labor's discounted marginal revenue product. And that's as far as our analysis of time has gone, really in the analytics uh, of Austrian economics. The, the, we haven't gone beyond this point, really. Now, just again, to uh, illustrate why this analysis is important, what, what advance it has made on the neoclassical is this idea of discounted marginal revenue product. We can see that the if we do immediate run analysis, what what, uh, what we get as a conclusion is we have prices for the iPhone SE right now, $399 right now, right? because we have a stock and we have total demand, and that price clears the market. And then we have prices for tech labor right now. So right now, companies are paying whatever uh, to hire, you know, $200,000 to hire some, some technician, some uh, IT person. Right, right now. But obviously, the, the hiring that's going right on right now is not generating the revenue from the sale of the good right now. Right? It's generating the revenue or will generate revenue in the future for goods sold in the future. So here, Apple is just hiring a tech person today who's working on the iPhone 7, and then revenue will be generated next year, you know, after, uh, well, late in the fall or whenever uh, the product comes out. So that's the reason for the discount, right? That we don't think of uh, a demand for the factors of production like the neoclassical economists do in a timeless way, but that we have this element of time sequence involved. We have a time structure uh, in our analysis uh, that leads us to this uh, important difference. Now, what, uh, we might ask the question then, uh, what, what implication would this have for cost analysis? And interestingly enough, uh, and this is the caveat that I mentioned earlier when I said that Rothbard doesn't do cost analysis, uh, he, he does this one step. He does take one step. And this one step, uh, he states this way. He says, in the ERE, of course, all costs and investments will be adjusted and irrevocably incurred costs for all firms will equal the price of the product minus pure interest return to the capitalist entrepreneur. That's the discounting that we talked about. And also, as we see, uh, minus the return to the discounted marginal productivity uh, of the owners, a factor which does not enter into the firm's cost. You see, he's, he's noticed this, right? Well, what does he make of this? Well, in chapter 10, he gives us, again, this is, uh, I just uh, reproduced this from chapter 10 of uh, uh, Man, Economy, and State. 
he gives us this analysis. This is the chapter on monopoly. And again, for those of you who are you know, uh, economists in the room, you know that uh, in monopolistically imperfect markets, uh, the argument is that uh, the demand curve and the cost curve will be tangent because there won't be any monopoly return to in that market. And that implies if, if you if you were to move that cost curve up and make it tangent at point F, it, it shows that this firm is uh, has invested too much in capital. Right? They have excess capacity. They're, they're not operating at the minimum point of their average cost curve. They've invested in this capital capacity and then they don't utilize it fully. And that's an inefficiency. And Rothbard's saying, no, no, no. If we include the element of time discount, we can see that that's not true. The, the entrepreneur will not uh, equate the price of his product with his average cost. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll discount the cost, right? And this certainly allows for the possibility that it, he would operate at the minimum point of average cost. And we don't get this inefficiency at all. This, this is a wonderful insight, right? That, that Rothbard has achieved by using the standard cost analysis and just integrating this element of time preference discount in, into the analysis. It's a you know, wonderful thing. <clears throat> um, okay, so then the the, the next uh, so what I'm suggesting what I'm suggesting is we can just generalize this. We we could generalize this right for all production in the ERE if it's if it's true for a, mon a monopolistically imp uh, imperfectly competitive uh, uh, firm. Well, it would have to be true of all firms in the ERE. So so let's think about an example like that. Um, and here again, uh, Rothbard's comment. Uh, that leads us to this. He says, once we bring investment interest return into the picture, we see the whole elaborate cost curve structure is totally fa uh, faulty and should be tossed into the discard. That, that's where I disagree with Rothbard. I think it could be, I think his own analysis shows it can be retained uh, usefully, right? It, it's somewhat helpful uh, for us to do this. Uh, in fact, if nothing else, it allows us to converse more fully with our neoclassical friends, right? And, and to show them that if, if they actually did a more realistic analysis, that they, they wouldn't reach the conclusions they reach. But if, but if we're not willing to you know, um, show them this in their, uh, using the apparatus of cost curves, they, they, they might just reject it on those grounds, right? We're not analytical. We're not, being, you know, we're not adopting some sort of standard economic uh, analysis, just like we would be rejected, perhaps, if we didn't use demand and supply analysis by certain, by certain persons. So... At least, if nothing else, there's a rhetorical advantage uh, to be gained. <clears throat> uh, okay, so I think, uh, I, I would say then that the, the key element here, if we want to think about the uh, generalization of this, is in, uh, is in the idea of capitalization again. So again, just to orient our minds toward this, uh, Rothbard says, man, economy, and state, costs are not fixed by an invisible hand, but are determined precisely by the total force of entrepreneurial demand for factors uh, of production. As Bumbavork and the Austrians pointed out, costs conform to prices and not the other way around. So we know in the ERE, costs must be conforming to prices, right? And so we must get this regularity somehow in the ERE. And if we integrate uh, the, uh, the idea of a discount, of an interest rate discount, the analysis would go something like this. Now, let, let me uh, provide a concrete example that, that I'm illustrating here. Let's suppose in the ERE we have a uh, market where all the sellers sell a, a homogeneous product. So let, let's say it's the corn market. And so whether you're a corn producer in Pennsylvania, a corn producer in, in uh, Nebraska, you're going to get the same price. It's a, a homogeneous units of the goods. So that, that's the setup. The P, the dots above the Q1 and Q2 uh, are at the same price level. But it's certainly possible in the real world, outside of the model of the neoclassical economists where this would be assumed away, it's certainly possible in the real world for the production, uh, the, the efficient production arrangement to be different in different places. So I mentioned Pennsylvania and Nebraska simply to illustrate this. So in Nebraska, there are wide open spaces. Uh, I grew up in Nebraska and, uh, you know, I didn't think this was strange at all until I moved to Pennsylvania. But in Nebraska, the roads are even all uh, constructed in sections, in mile square sections. So if you drive out of the rural towns, 
you'll drive on, you know, country roads, as we would say, they're not really country roads like they are, you know, here in the South, but uh, rural roads. And they're all in a grid pattern at 90 degree angles. And they're all one mile on a, on a side, right? And they're farms that take up, you know, several sections of land. Now in Pennsylvania, you cannot do this. In Pennsylvania, there, there's no farm, there's no level farmable land that that's, that that's uh, you know, big enough to have like a section, like a mile square area where you're farming all in corn. And you can imagine the difference then in the production techniques. So in Nebraska, they have these gigantic pivoting, uh, um, um, uh, irrigation, uh, processes, gigantic machines that, uh, that pivot around a, a fixed point to, to irrigate the, the corn. Now you could not set those up in Pennsylvania, <laughs> even on, even on the, you know, the most level ground, they wouldn't run be because it, it's, it's undulating, right? And the machine would just fall apart or stop, you know, grind to a halt or whatever. So you don't use that technology, you use something else. So you have these gigantic reaping machines in Nebraska because you can just sweep across these flat areas. And then in, in Pennsylvania, you just have tractors, just regular old tractors and, and so on. So in the ERE, if we had an ERE, what would, what would happen? And, and the answer is, well, we know that the price of corn, the price of the output's the same. The rate of return has to be the same in the two industries, right? Because it's higher in one and lower in the other, the, the adjustment would take place, the arbitrage of the investors would take place, and they'd move out of the low return and into the high return, and they'd, they'd push the returns to equality. So if the price is the same and the rate of return is the same, then, then the cost has to be the same. The average cost has to be the same. So it would have to look something like this. It doesn't look like an envelope curve, right? It looks something like this. And that, I think, is the key, the key insight uh, of how capitalization can, uh, you know, what effect it has with respect to time, at least this element of time. <clears throat> now, here's the, here's the next step. We know that this production process, and again, hopefully my Pennsylvania, Nebraska corn example illustrates this, uses both non-specific factors of production and specific. We've already mentioned some of the specific factors of production, these gigantic uh, irrigation systems and huge uh, um, reaping machines and so on that, that can only be used in these Midwest farms, in the Great Plains farms. And then they're not, they're not of much use in the you know, farms in other places. Uh, but the labor might command the same wage across, across agriculture in these two states. A fertilizer would probably have the same price, right? So all the, all the non-specific factors of production, again, in the RE would have the same price across these two production processes. So if the costs are going to be the same and the prices of the, the, the specific or the non-specific goods are the same, and yet the production, the, the actual production of the, of the uh, uh, assets, the specific assets are different, then their prices must be different, right? So if it's much more productive to grow corn in, uh, in the Nebraska, then the prices of the reapers and the and the, the you know, irrigation systems must be proportionately higher than the prices of the assets used in Pennsylvania, right? The, it's capitalized into into the prices of the assets, and that is what sets the price structure. That's what keeps the price structure in Nebraska from being lower than the price structure, even though it's more physically productive than the price structure in Pennsylvania. It'll be higher because the asset prices are higher. And so, again, we can depict this just by showing shifts of the cost structure right, up and down. <clears throat> okay, so that's the idea. And uh, here again, I'm not saying that Murray doesn't recognize this. He, he clearly understands all this. This is all verbally, again, in the Austrian uh, writings. The various costs, uh, that is prices of the factors uh, determined by their various uh, discounted marginal value products and alternative uses are ultimately determined solely by consumer demands for all the uses. It must not be forgotten, furthermore, that changes in demand uh, and selling price will change the prices and incomes of specialized factors. That's the key point, right? That they're the locus of capitalization in the same direction. So if demand goes up for the product, the, the specific asset prices will rise. But if the specific asset prices rise, the cost structure's gone up. See, and, it, and, and prices conform to, uh, I mean, the costs conform to prices. Uh, so the cost curves so fashionable in current economics assume fixed fast factor prices, ignoring this variability. And again, the, we can reject that assumption, I think, without rejecting 
the cost curve apparatus itself. Now let's take another uh, il illustration of, uh, of uh, what would happen. Now this is the final state of rest. So now we're not in the ERE, but in the final state of rest. And again, just uh, we're all on the same page. When uh, economists do final state of rest analysis, they take a, a given equilibrium. So we're in a given situation where there's no further change. And then one factor changes. And then we trace through uh, all the other factors that would change since the economy is an integrated unit over time. And then, and then we state what the final new equilibrium would look like. So, so that's doing final state of rest analysis. So let's suppose that uh, we think through the, the cost curve uh, implications of an example for the final state of rest. So here my example, we start at, uh, at the demand and cost relationships that generate the price P1 and the average cost structure for some producer is AC1. So again, it's a discounted, so the cost lies below the, the price, right? <clears throat> and then the demand falls, and we want to trace through the effects. So the demand goes down for this product. And uh, uh, the way I've depicted it, the, the demand has gone down to the point where the price flow, uh, falls below the average cost structure. The losses uh, would ensue if the cost structure stayed at that point. <clears throat> but uh, to the contrary, of course, what would happen in the final state of rest is that investors would decapitalize this industry, right? They'd sell out the assets, and uh, then the asset prices would fall. The specific asset prices would fall, right? Not the, not the uh, non-specific factor prices. They might stay the same. Wages might stay the same, and, and so on. Material prices. Uh, but the asset prices would fall. Once the asset prices fall, then profitability is restored, right? The rate of return is restored. And so the production uh, continues. Uh, let me give you a couple of uh, examples uh, from uh, uh, our recent uh, circumstances on this. <clears throat> We've all uh, heard about the uh, the introduction of Uber and what's happened to the uh, taxi industries in various cities in the face of Uber competition. So a few months ago, there were stories in the uh, Bloomberg Financial about what's happened to the price of taxi medallions in New York City. So that's a, that's a highly specific asset to run a taxi business, right? So when, when Uber competition starts to shift demand away from the taxi industry, this doesn't mean that the taxi industry suffers, uh, uh, you know, ongoing production losses. <laughs> uh, it means that the specific asset prices fall. They, they suffer capital loss, right? That's the effect. They, they suffer an immediate capital loss. And all the future profitability of having the taxi medallion is now, is now discounted into the present value of those new asset prices. And so if you want to buy into the taxi industry today, or if you're an ongoing business running a taxi, you're, you're still profitable. Right? Because you, you suffered a one-time capital loss, but your ongoing production is uh, profitable, precisely because your asset prices have fallen. Um, you know, another, and by the way, then uh, my final state of rest analysis here is truncated, obviously. I'm not, because actually what would happen in this case is that the specific assets of running an Uber business would rise in price. The specific assets of running a standard taxi would fall. And then resources would shift toward the production of, of Uber specific factors of production, right? And out of the, out of the production of taxi medallion. Uh, so, so rent seeking would diminish or whatever. <clears throat> uh, we can also think of the, the, this analysis applied to the uh, recent uh, turmoil in oil markets <clears throat> and the closing of shale uh, oil wells in the U.S. So it's a similar sort of thing. You, know, you read Bloomberg Financial during this period, and they, they were per they were perplexed. You know, they they would put out these stories that would say, you know, here are the cost of production of a barrel of oil in Saudi Arabia. It's $16 a barrel or whatever. And here they are in Iran, it's $22 a barrel. And here they are in Texas, and it's, uh, whatever, $40 a barrel. And here they are in the shale industry in uh, North Dakota, and it's $80 a barrel. And yet when the price of a barrel of oil fell from 100 down through 60 down to 40, the North Dakota producers were still producing. Okay, well, what, you know, what's going on? And what's going on is they're still producing because, well, at some point they stop, right? We'll get to that in a minute, but they're still producing because the value of the shale oil wells themselves have collapsed. They suffered their loss, boom, just like that. They suffered their capital loss. And now at that lower value of the assets, 
their cost structure has fallen and it's still it's still uh, useful for them to continue, right? Even though the price has gone below what Bloomberg reports is their cost. <clears throat> they haven't adjusted their cost for the capitalization change. And that's what's uh, 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 going on. Um, by the way, you know that uh, the price of oil has been going back up and the shale wells have not been brought back into production yet, right? Even though they were in production at, at forty dollars a barrel on the way down, they're not back in production at forty dollars a barrel. Now there there are of course nuances to this analysis, but the basic reason for this with respect to capitalization is that capitalization is always forward looking. Right? That's the that's the key to the whole thing. It's always forward looking. It's always the opportunity cost of what we can do in the future if we don't give up the the opportunity to take that action in the present. And so they're anticipating, in other words, uh, even higher prices in the future that they can hold back than their asset and employ it then in the future when the price structure has been restored. Yeah. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> now the next step in this then is to get to the, to the actual substantive point, which I've been alluding to all throughout, this, uh, the, the addition of uh, uncertainty into the analysis. And so here we, uh, again, I take my cue from uh, Mises where he says, the notion of change implies the notion of a temporal sequence. A rigid, eternally immutable universe would be out of time, but it would be dead. The concepts of time and change are inseparably linked together. Action aims at change and is therefore in the temporal order. So when we talk about time and the theory of cost, we also have to include uncertainty. That, that's an element of time, right? And, and hence my, the title of my talk. Uh, Rothbard is the same, uh, takes the same position. Uh, he says this in commenting on Kersner's book. He's, he's, he makes a general comment for the book. Why has there been no discussion of the important influence of speculation on price determination? Well, that's a very good question. Shouldn't, shouldn't we integrate speculation into price determination? <clears throat> okay, so then the question is, uh, what happens if we do this? So let me, let me just provide now a kind of comparative summary of my uh, uh, analysis, and, th and then we'll go through the details of it. So it, it would look something like this. If we're in the neoclassical world, it's timeless. And this, again, is the labor market for some, for some type of labor. And they would say the wage is determined by the marginal revenue product, the demand the entrepreneurs have, the marginal revenue product, and then the supply of the workers. And it's timeless in the sense that we don't have this time sequence, right? So there's no discounting and uh, the wage that's being paid today is somehow synchronous with the prices of the output and, and so on. And then what we have in, uh, in uh, Mises and Rothbard is a time sequence. We have time, but it's just the time sequence of the stages of production. We have the time structure of production. And here we see then that the entrepreneurs will not uh, base their demand on marginal revenue product, but they'll discount the marginal revenue product. So they'll only pay a price today that, uh, that allows them to earn a rate of interest when they pay for the inputs and then receive the uh, revenue in the future. And then what I'm suggesting is, and it, again, I'm not claiming that the, the, this insight is not in the literature. What I'm claiming is we need to put this insight, this further insight into our analytics. And the further insight is uncertainty. So we have not only, not only does time imply a uh, time structure where we have to take account of the discount. Time also implies uncertainty and so we have to take account of anticipations. So this is anticipated discounted marginal revenue product. And again, it's not my claim that Mises and Rothbard don't you know, you know, have this insight. It's my claim that they make almost no use of this in their analytics. They don't, they don't sort of build it explicitly into their analytics. So what happens when we do this if we return um, if we return to uh, the analytics, the immediate run price of goods and the immediate run price of factors, um, and then uh, make a, a concluding remark. So here we just notice uh, that the supply and demand, the bo both sides of the market, are based on uh, the entrepreneur's anticipation of the future, of the opportunity costs in the future. So again, to use my iPhone example, Tim Cook and the entrepreneurs uh, at uh, Apple are uh, setting the supply, their their willingness to sell at three ninety nine today, the uh, to to the buyers of uh, the iPhone, they've taken into account their anticipations of what demands will be in the future. Will they be Will they be higher next month? Will it Will the 
uh, uh, phone prove to be uh, popular or will it be lower or they've already they've already built that into their supply today right it that's a fundamental uh, feature of it and then the same with the customers the customers who buy the iPhone uh, uh, SE uh, can only anticipate the the usefulness of it to them in the future right it isn't it isn't that they know this or that their uh, subjective values will always be realized but they are just engaged in anticipations. Now, again, uh, wh why does this matter? Well, I would say that uh, it's important for us, one important implications of, of this is that it reinforces uh, Bumbavwerk's marginal pairs analysis, and again, distinguishes our analysis quite sharply from the neoclassical, where in the neoclassical world, they basically have this notion of a, of a given economic agent, right? and the economic agent just has a a preference uh, map or something. And uh, the trade between the different economic agents occurs mainly because they have different endowments to begin with, but their utility structures are basically the same. <clears throat> uh, and so we don't get any sort of individual spectrum of valuing things. At the margin we do, but not fundamentally, right? But we can see that this difference is really fundamental because each consumer is just is just anticipating what the value will be. And obviously every consumer will have a different accuracy of their anticipations. For some, uh, their expectations will be met. For some, they'll be exceeded. For some, uh, the, they won't be reached. And then the person will react again, right? Will act again in the, in the face of that. <clears throat> and the same thing then for, uh, uh, for the supply side. So when we get to factors of production, then we can see that uh, the entrepreneur's demand for the factors of production is also based upon just their anticipation of what realized discounted marginal revenue product will come from hiring this, this input or purchasing this input. And once again, why this is helpful is that it uh, clearly implies that, that this, this uh, spectrum of demand, this downward sloping demand curve, is based not uh, um, solely upon, let's say, different starting points for the different entrepreneurs who see everything exactly the same way. Quite the contrary, it's embedded into uh, the, the differences that exist among human persons. And that some of the entrepreneurs simply perceive the future uh, results more favorably, and some perceive them less favorably, the same situation, and some perceive it uh, you know, somewhere in the middle. So we've get, we have this Boombavarkian marginal pairs analysis brought to the forefront to, to help us see this, uh, see, see this uh, divergence. <clears throat> okay, and then, then the final point that I want to make uh, it has to do then with the adjustment process. The final point about once we integrate the anticipations into, uh, into the... Uh, standard analysis, then how does this help us with the dynamic, explaining the dynamic process? So here's Mises again. There's nothing automatic or mechanical in the operation of the market. The entrepreneurs eager to earn profits appear as bidders at an auction, as it were, in which the owners of the factors of production put up for sale land, capital goods, and labor. The entrepreneurs are eager to outdo one another by bidding higher prices than their rivals. Their offers are limited on the one hand by their anticipation of future prices of the products and on the other by the necessity to snatch, uh, snatch the factors of production away from the hands of other entrepreneurs competing with them. But again, un unsaid is other entrepreneurs are doing the same thing, right? They just have anticipations of the future. And so we have one entrepreneur with more accurate anticipations and another entrepreneur with less accurate on, uh, expectations. And the entrepreneur with more accurate is able to bid away the factor. So let me take one more uh, illustration of this. Um, let's say we have a uh, given industry where the current conventional production process is uh, AC zero. So most of the producers are using this production process. They're selling the product at P zero and selling a quantity of Q zero. And then there's another group of entrepreneurs that recognize a, an existing alternative technology that would allow them to better cater to the uh, customers and so fetch higher prices. And yet, because the, the potential in these assets is not recognized by its competitors, they're able to buy the assets at low prices. And so they see this profit opportunity. And so they jump in first and uh, they're able to acquire the assets at very low prices. 
And then when the other entrepreneurs see the realized value of this investment structure, they will then modify theirs, right? The investors will simply shift more heavily into this new configuration and the and then and then the market adjusts to a new uh, point where the rate of return on the new investment uh, structure will be normalized. and and uh, you know that's how the dynamic uh, would work itself out. Now, the final thing, let me put up a final quote by uh, Mises uh, indicating this and make one, one just final remark as you read that quote. Here he's just talking about the superiority of certain entrepreneurs. So this is what I'm claiming, that superior entrepreneurs jump in first and obtain the profit, and their action then moves the prices of assets to their new equilibrium, if you will. Um, I don't have time to uh, discuss this, but I... In my own judgment, this this modification is is uh, pregnant with implications, and uh, I hope uh, all of us uh, think think uh, through these implications and uh, and uh, push forward uh, the Austrian uh, paradigm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.